Perfect. Thank you, Claire. It's absolutely fantastic to be here. And let's just jump straight into it, looking at the navigation of people with a visual impairment, the challenges and the requirements. So in today's presentation, we're really going to start from the basics to go, well, what is visual impairment? What is the scope of visual impairment? And what's the difference between visual function and functional vision? We then dive into the requirements um, and look at the scale and the frameworks which we apply to make sure that the systems that we designed are actually fit for purpose. Mireille is then going to take over and translate our user level requirements to our service requirements and how we can actually achieve system integrity um, in today's complex urban spaces. We're then going to wrap up and talk about how all of this is coming together and the WeWalk Smart Cane, which I'm very, very excited to show you all. So without further ado, let's jump straight into scoping visual impairment. And I'd actually like to start this with a bit of a personal story. So I'm visually impaired myself with Lieber's congenital amaurosis. This basically means that I have a very narrow tunnel vision and I am blind at night. And I actually grew up in Abu Dhabi. And Abu Dhabi really is an amazing place. I mean, they've built a whole city in, in 40 years. But the thing is, that has come with growing pains. And I'd always remember as a child, you know, when I was being driven from school and to malls and to see my friends and all, I'd always think to myself and go, well, I definitely would not be able to do any of this independently. It was quite restrictive. And that's because at the time, the country itself just did not have the accessibility standards that a visually impaired person such as myself would require for independence. There was no uh, tactile paving, uh, mapping solutions just weren't that accessible, both from an interface level and also a system availability level. And as a result, um, there was some isolation at the time. And when I moved to the UK, um, that independence and my ability to actually, you know, live my daily life became significantly improved. It was quite a, a night and day difference. And it made me realize, at least, that before we really get into the technological standpoint and mega architecture, we just have to take it to its core and actually look at the fundamentals of visual impairment. So what is visual impairment? Well, it's a disability. It's a disability which has a long-term impact on one's ability to carry out activities of daily living. It's a disability which causes a reduction in sight, which hinders the person's ability to use both their sight, but also their visual memory, so identifying certain environmental cues like shop fronts and signage. And as a result, um, as an inevitable result even, uh, visually impaired people are just more susceptible, susceptible to hazard when carrying out mobility activities. And it's not just me, it's 253 million visually impaired people worldwide. And it's a population which is continuously growing. I mean, in the UK, there are 2 million visually impaired moments at the moment, and that's going to double to 4 million visually impaired people by 2050 because of visual impairment and its prevalence in older age groups and a growing population. And well, frankly, the technology available for the visually impaired community just really isn't up there from both a user and service perspective. And as a result, there tends to be a lot of societal segregation. I mean, one in four visually impaired people are in employment and one in 10 blind people are in employment. Those are pretty low numbers. I mean, it's a, num it's, it's, it's a fact that has a long-term knock-on impact to our economy. I mean, based on some research conducted by the RNIB and Deloitte, uh, the yearly cost of visual impairment is 28 billion pounds. That's just to provide the tools and to provide the care needed to get someone that's visually impaired um, to basically uh, integrate into society. And that's huge. And so before we begin to tackle the topic of requirements, we have to establish this fundamental understanding of what is visual impairment from the biological level. And it's only with this systematic approach that we can really start to target and solve a lot of the visually impaired community's issues. So after you know this systematic approach first includes that biological review, but then we also have to look at gaps in the literature, looking at how engineering currently considers visual impairment and comparing and contrasting this to medical research to find out, well, where they can both complement each other. What you end up finding is, on the engineering side, a lot of the finer details of visual impairment, such as visual function, which I'll get onto later, tend to be missed out. And in the medical research, you tend to find some amazing work done into the eye, but just not enough work done into how architecture um, and the surrounding urban environment can help visually impaired people. So we have to marry those two worlds to begin with. We then dive into devising our own experimentation. Because this is such a niche field, we need to take it back to its fundamentals and go, okay, how do we define experiments that are actually, well, validatable and actually cater to these requirements? And how do we then iterate on them to deliver a system which is fit for purpose? And that's where we get the last two points, which is building a system based on these fundamental requirements. 
So visual function and functional vision. Uh, very confusingly named, but uh, they are very, very different things. And at their very core, it's about defining observable and measurable parameters that are, that are critical. And here's the process of visual function and functional vision. So at the very core, we have the human biology. We have what the actual organ can process from the optic nerve to the retina itself to the brain. What can the person actually see? And this is termed as visual function. Here, we can have medical intervention, but this is not really where navigation comes into play. What we need to do from a navigational perspective is look at visual function and understand it, but we can't really intervene. We then move on with the provision of aids and tools that a visually impaired person might use onto functional vision. And this basically is what the person does with their vision, what capacity they have to live their daily life. And this is really where navigational systems come in. So in summary, we must have an understanding of visual function. Oh, I'm not quite sure why my slide doubled there. We must have an understanding of visual function and appreciate what the person can see from a physiological and a psychological perspective. But we must also consider visual functional vision, where we look into what they can actually do with that vision, how they access goods and services and urban environments. So going back to visual function, well, what are the parameters of sight from the very base? We first have contrast sensitivity and color vision, which are you know, quite self-explanatory. It's the ability of a visually impaired person to distinguish surfaces of different color and different contrast. And this is quite well understood. If we look at British Standard uh, A300, for instance, uh, there are provisions for something called LRV, light refractance values, to show what a ideal environment will have in terms of contrast for someone that is visually impaired. We then have the visual field, which is, the space in which a person can identify visual stimuli. This is split up into central vision, which is the inner 30 degrees of vision, often used for reading and what you're looking at directly in front of you, and peripheral vision, which are points that lie outside central vision. They can extend up to 100 degrees temporally. And again, there's huge variation here because some people might have different variations in their monocular visual field, so the visual field in each eye. Some people might have fantastic peripheral vision and no central vision. Some might have fantastic central vision and no peripheral vision, such as myself. So it's very variable, just as contrast sensitivity and color vision. We finally have visual acuity. And this is probably one of the most understood and most widely used parameters of sight. This is the person's ability to differentiate two points as being separate. So how blurry something is in its simplest form. And the beauty of this is these can all be measured. We can actually quantify this from medical research. So we can use a Pelly robson graph. It's, again, a very old and well-known chart to identify a person's ability to identify letters of different contrast. And this translates well to their actual mobility in real life. We can use a Snellen chart for visual acuity. I'm sure everyone watching this must have undergone one of these exams before. And we have some amazing medical tools and devices which can measure things like the visual field, such as Optimus perimetry. So we can put numbers to all of these things. But then we move on to functional vision, which is slightly more abstract and a lot more difficult to measure. And that makes it a bit challenging for us as navigation and civil engineers, because this is where we take visual function and we quantify it into how a person actually behaves on a day-to-day -day basis. And whilst you know, there have been these parameters in literature, which I'll go through in a bit, there still remains some contention as to what really is representative of a person's functional vision. So we can use something called preferred walking speed, which is the person's optimal walking speed in any given environment, and then percentage preferred walking speed, which is the person's reduction in walking speed based on uh, a suboptimal environment. We can also look at confidence and other psychological factors. There exists a wealth of papers out there that look at the psychological impacts and how we measure them in visually impaired people. And we can also look at things like orientation errors and path inefficiencies. So loads of ways to measure functional vision. But as I said, there still remains some contention. And I think this is a perfect case study of that. So um, I myself have the RPE65 gene mutation of LCEA. And currently, in the whole wide world, there are two medical solutions um, that promise to not cure this, but to alleviate some of the stresses of LCA. So bear in mind, these are cutting edge and the only two solutions out there. And they both use mobility as a key indicator of success. The Spark Therapeutic Luxterna um, mobility testing uses something called the MLMT, the Multi-Luminance Mobility Mat, where they look at how a visually impaired person navigates on a map with on a on a mat, sorry, with instructions. 
Now, the second competing study uh, run by Myra GTX uses the Pamela facility in a completely different environmental setup uh, and a completely different experimental methodology. So here we have essentially two of the only competing um, you know, treatments out there using, frankly, incomparable um, methods of testing functional vision, which just comes to show sort of how unexplored this field is. And so it goes far beyond that. And this adds to the complexity. So functional vision is far more than just walking speed in a given environment or how much a person deviates from the optimal path. In fact, it's about employment. It's about transport ridership. It's about access to family and friends and the overall quality of life. And that becomes a lot more difficult to measure. So I've talked to you about how difficult it is to actually measure all of this. At least I'll give you something, some framework for how we measure it and how we try to make the most of this very complex system. So let's actually talk about the requirements now. And we begin with a scaled approach. And uh, this has been shown in literature to be probably the most optimal approach to human behavior modeling. We start with the microscopic level where we look at the individual by themselves in their own separate bubble. We go, okay, what is your visual function? How much can you see as a person? What are your psychological traits and what is your own self-awareness? We then look at the macroscopic picture. We look at the environment. We look at the surroundings of that individual, the signage, the crowds, and everything that comes with a larger scale approach. But the most effective approach is when we look at things mesoscopically, where we look at individual X and environment Y and derive the unique characteristics that actually come out from looking at a system in this way. And so let's look at an actual example. Let's take an individual with LCA with poor dim light vision and poor peripheral vision. I'm kind of describing myself here, so I'm not very imaginative, as you can see. Uh, but let's look at the microscopic level, that individual person. If we look at the individual level on the very left and we look at the physiological part, we see visual function. The organ level, how much can that individual see? We then also look at other impairments. For instance, those with cerebral palsy might also present visual impairments, but their mobility will not be limited just by their visual function, but also by their other mobility impairments that come along with that. So that's another consideration for us. We can then move, in, move along to look at the psychological requirements. And we see there's actually a difference between the short-term cognitive state and the long-term cognitive state. We found in literature that the visually impaired person actually regulates their walking speed based on their confidence in a given environment rather than their actual visual function. So visual function only has an indirect impact on mobility. So we have to then look at that individual in situ in that environment to go, how confident are you at that moment? And how do we measure that? And how does our, does our system improve that? We then also look at the long-term cognitive capacity and the requirements that come along with that, where we say, okay, what are your general feelings to mobility? How do you feel being outdoors? This is essentially a systematic scalar, which we can apply. We can then look at things more microscopically. We can introduce the concept of crowd dynamics and we can see, okay, now that you're in a realistic environment, how do you, from a physiological perspective, use your visual function to interact with others around you? And then from a more psychological perspective, how do you then, well, behave? How are you self-aware? Because it's much more than just how can you see the crowd around you? There are loads of feelings associated with this. But then how do we translate these to the design of a navigation system as we're attempting to do today? Well, let's take that same person with poor dim light uh, vision and introduce them. So we can measure their PWS, which is their optimal walking speed in the best environment possible. Again, the literature specifies many different ways in which we can measure this. We can either provide them with a sighted companion in a familiar environment, or we can give them an environment with a straight line with no obstacles to see what their best walking speed is. We can then, given our understanding of their visual function and the fact that they struggle the most in dim light environments, introduce a dim light environment with a reduced familiarity, and we can measure their PPWS, their percentage preferred walking speed, to find the difference to see, okay, this is how much performance we have lost. We can then introduce and iterate our navigation system to see how different changes actually amount to changes in PTWS and the user's own confidence. So now we can iterate and build. And the aim of our navigation system, therefore, will be to bring that PPWS figure as close to the PWS optimal walking speed as possible. And what we've achieved here then is by taking our understanding of visual function and the environments in which the user might struggle the most, 
We can actually devise a system that plays to these weaknesses and tries to fill in the gaps in the person's vision, thus delivering a system that maximizes functional vision which I think is, is really cool and really exciting. It's about delivering that unique experience. But we cannot do this simply from user requirements. We must also consider the system's technical capacity. So on to you, Mireille. Thank you, John Mark, for this uh, interesting first part of the presentation. So by now, we have established that the aim of the VIP navigation tool is indeed to account for the VIP functional vision requirements and to optimize them. Ideally, we want to do that in all modes of operational environments and seamlessly. Now, let's look at the relationship between the user requirements and the system engineering requirements. To do that, we will be using hazard analysis methods in order to analyze risks in complex environments. Then we will identify and quantify the RMPs of the parameters that Jean-Marc has just mentioned. So what are these RMPs? We know that we have four. The first one is accuracy, and that is the deviation from the truth. The second is the integrity, and that's the measure of trust in sensors information. Then we have continuity, which is the probability of unscheduled loss of operation. And if we have all three, we can say that the system is available or it has what we call operational economy. We also saw previously with Jean-Marc that the way to capture the requirements is through the understanding and optimization of what we call the functional vision. Now, to do that, we need to quantify this functional vision. How, we do, that, how do we do that? Through the quantification of its matrix of parameters. Once we have these, we now derive what we call system requirements in terms of the RMP parameters. And here, we use a mixture of operational error analysis and hazard analysis. For example, to get position accuracy, we use functional vision parameters such as the preferred walking speed or the minimum acceptable error for collision avoidance. Then we compute the respective errors in positioning, which we call sigma p, and we choose the most stringent error to be our accuracy measure. Same thing goes for integrity, which is a function of the position accuracy, but this time through the alert limit. Um, for those who don't know what the alert limit is, is the limit at which the service becomes not only lacking accuracy, but also posing hazards to users, as reflected by what we call the integrity risk. So this integrity risk is also a function of other parameters, such as the TTA and the PL. The TTA is the time to alert. So this is how quickly an alarm can be issued. And the PL is our best estimate of the position error. OK, so by now we've established that the RMPs are a function of the functional vision. And this quantification is very much a work in, in progress for all of us at Imperial College and at Astra and with John Mark. Of course, because we are dealing with the mission critical application, we expect these RMPs to be more stringent. To give you an example, if we look at this graph, for example, this is the um, government requirements for an autonomous vehicle. So the, the accuracy requirement, if you see it on the graph, is just slightly higher than 10 centimeters, while the integrity requirement is below 10 minus 7. So let's imagine what it would be like for a VIP or a blind person who's totally reliant on this application for their safety and even their survival in the middle of a pedestrian network. Now, to achieve this level of accuracy, we will be using GNSS carrier phase. We have to. And then to deliver also the required level of integrity, we must use carrier phase RAIM. Because of the mission criticality here, the next question is to ask ourselves, are these RMP enough or do we need to think about resilience? Okay, so this graph is a bit complex, but we try in here to explain uh, the proposed functional architecture of the system. So we started with four main functions. The first one is sensing and communication. The second is situational awareness. The third is decision and planning. And at the bottom, you can see something called device control or the operating system. Now, if we start from the top left, the orange bit, we see that we need a macro level sensing function. We also need some prior information to do that, such as building structure models. We need pre-existing maps. We, me we need also environmental factors, such as weather forecasts, uh, road network closures or diversions, any barriers that, that could actually arise along the way. These, along with our sensing and localization 
controls and ideally an ultra low latency communication and a super secure one will provide us with the required situational awareness uh, to produce what we call an environmental model at the macro scale. From there, the system can produce our route planner or mission planner at the strategic level. And then from the strategic level, we can move to the tactical or the operational level. At the operation level decision making, so here we could have got what we call meso or micro scale environmental model. So this is really more granular level here. For example, we will be dealing with the parameters that Jean-Marc has talked about. So here we'll be looking at the preferred walking speed, percentage of collision, we'll be like characterizing surfaces and doing surface estimation. All the above need to be highly synchronized in time and coordinated at the sub-functional level through the means of what we call the device control or the operating system. Needless to say that due to the complexity of the system, we will have also many reiterative loops in the various functions. Okay, so uh, we've seen the functional architecture in the previous slide, but the next question is where does the PNT function or functions sit in this architecture? Is it at the front end, that means at the actuation function, or is it at the back end or both? We do actually need PNT at so many sub-functional levels, as we can see in blue here, all the blue boxes uh, represent the PNT functions. That is due to our need for extreme accuracy. For example, when it comes to sensors and localization, we would want to get a pose estimate. So the challenge here is to find a compromise between dimensioning, so that's um, um, the level of sensor fusion, complexity, and, and the cost. Because PNT is indeed needed at the back end and at the front end, so basically where the movement control level is. Okay, so we mentioned resilience before. Um, so in this slide, I'm gonna try to explain resilience a little bit in the way that we define it. So resilience is a function of many parameters. The first one is original steady state, the disruptive phase, the recovery phase, and the depth of disruption and a new steady state. So uh, if we look at the graph, let's assume we have a system that is on originally functioning very well. Uh, so we call this functioning at the original steady state. Then something happens and disrupts the system. So we enter what we call the disruptive phase, and hopefully after some time, it starts recovering. Now here we enter the new steady state, and here we have different scenarios. We can have, have it to be equal to the original steady state, worse or better. Now the aim is to minimize delta T and DOD, and uh, that's because DOD and delta T, they're all functions of the four parameters we talked about before, or the RMPs, accuracy, integrity, continuity, and availability. So the question is, how do we achieve resilience? And at which stage is resilience needed? So because we believe resilience is such an important requirement for trust, our aim is to apply the concept of resilience across the whole systems platform. This leads us to the work program in this diagram. So as we said, the first thing is for us to link the user requirements to the system requirements. Then we will be studying the system vulnerabilities and failures by analyzing all these failures and looking at mitigation techniques. To do so, we will look at GNSS resilience from a various perspective, for example, receiver faults, things like multipass, data corruption, noise, clock problems, satellite measurement and data problems like IONO, TROPO, etc. The network correction, generation and transmission problems, these could be things like delays, outages, data corruption. And then we have to look at interference. So that's spoofing and jamming. After that, we will be studying vulnerabilities and interference for non-GNSS signals, whatever they are, 5G, Bluetooth, radar, etc. Then we study the resilience for map derived data. So for example, like map matching problems and maybe other sensors such as LIDAR. After that, we can say that we can specify a resilient PNT architecture and that we hope to be able to provide evidence-based policymaker advice. Now, talking about the importance of resilience for trust in the system lead us to the important role of integrity monitoring. So we know integrity monitoring is this parameter that is directly related to mission criticality. 
And the main parameters that we talked about before, the alert limit, integrity risk, time to alert, and protection level are depicted in this picture somehow. Okay, so the reason why the user specifies integrity risk, which is the risk they are willing to accommodate, is to conduct something called failure detection and exclusion techniques. And these techniques should be applied to both GNSS and non-GNSS technolo uh, technology measurements. So in this slide, I'll try to explain the basic integrity monitoring architecture. So let's see what it's like. If we apply this to GNSS, for example, we know we have, we have various types of measurements, such as carrier phase or pseudo range, and we can get their corresponding errors. And we know that errors can be blunders or systematic errors that can be modeled, or the stochastic errors like receiver noise. Now, these measurements are first cleaned from obvious blunders and modeled by using systematic error modeling then these measurements are, are used to help us get what we call the observation equation so what is the observation equation it's the equation that links these measurements to the required parameters for positioning basically x y z t to do so we need the positioning algorithms that have a functional model of linearization because we know that this is not a linear equation and an optimizer such as least square or kalman filter this will lead us to the position and its associated uncertainty through the, the covariance and the residuals. So the residuals really are how the measurements do contribute to the solution. Through, of course, this um, um, AX minus B equal B. Therefore, if we have an unacceptable error, for example, in the measurement, it should show up in the residuals. Now we take this position and the uncertainty and the residuals into what we call the integrity monitoring function. Here we need to formulate what we call a test statistic using the residuals. And because of the properties of the residuals, they are Gaussian, assuming they are Gaussian, we use the sum of the squares of residuals, also known as the sum of square error, SSE. Now we need to compare a threshold of the test statistic from the user-defined integrity requirement, e.g. probability of misdetection. Now, this FDE box sorry, here compares the test statistic SSE to the threshold to determine failure or no failure. This function works together with the computation of what we call the protection level, which is, we said is an estimate of our position error to determine whether the navigation system is to be used or not, depending on the alert limit. Okay, so now we talked about the assumption that our residual distribution is normal or Gaussian, but we know that in reality, most of the times it's not. It's not the case due to the variability in the collected measurements in complex environments such as cities. So by fitting the residuals to a normal distribution, we could be excluding some considerable errors that the distribution has failed to capture. Therefore, we need to overbound the distribution to ensure safety by capturing these errors within the distribution. So overbounding needs to take place all along the entire position computation chain, including integrity monitoring. So the position uncertainty and the residuals, along with what we call the nominal bias, which is the minimal, the detectable error, and the probability of misdetection, form what we call our protection level, which I mentioned earlier is our best estimate of the actual PE or position error. So we concluded that GNSS error characterization is a challenge and that the normal distribution is not necessarily the best fit. So the question is, which distribution presents a better fit? At Imperial, we looked at what we called GEV, or this generalized extreme value distribution, and we, re we realized that it is a better fit for position, positioning, especially at details where unfiltered blunders can be found. So the reason why we're using GEV is because of its flexibility. We know that a normal distribution has two parameters and a straightforward, and GEV had three parameters, which makes it a little bit more complex, but as we said, it's a it's, it's a more flexible one. 
Okay, so by using GAV, we improve error characterization, which means that the rate of inflation in the PL required to accommodate the errors is not as high as in the normal distribution, which in turn increases availability of the system. The same result is achieved with a combination of overbounding and the better characterization of error distribution, such as GAV. Now, if you look at this uh, graph, for example, uh, the green line is the overbounding, the red line is the best fit, and the aim always is to decrease the gap between them so we don't miss out on availability. Okay, so let's talk about the current weaknesses of RAIN. In the measurement domain, the measurement errors are assumed to be normally distributed, and overbounding is a complex problem. The FDE in measurement domain needs to consider temporal correlation, which we don't do so far, and we have a problem of error propagation for non-Gaussian distribution. In the ambiguity domain, the FDE for potential failures at this stage is not yet well studied, and the integer n is not yet fully validated. In the position domain, the FDE for multiple simultaneous failures still to be fully realized. So integrity monitoring algorithms are very complex indeed. And the protection level computation can be challenging due to many factor, uh, factors such as distribution, overbounding, and error propagation. Okay, so now that we found GAV and we understand the strengths and weaknesses of it, we continue to look for other distribution. In this case, we are addressing the complexity issue of GAV by deriving a normal distribution from the GAV distribution, and we call this the GAV-based normal distribution. Okay, so despite all the successes so far, we still seek better overbounding techniques. And the reason for this is even though we have developed better fitting distribution, there's still a likelihood that some of these unacceptable errors are not covered by the distribution or the newly found distribution, let's say, at the required level of integrity risks. Here we are doing this. So the first one is to look for other distributions, such as a combination of a T distribution with GAV with normal, where, for example, T distribution is a better fit at the body, while GAV is a better fit at the tails, and we have the normal distribution that we all like to work with because it's the simplest. Uh, second, we, uh, we are overbounding through prediction using machine learning this time methods, enabling us to understand the factors, all the quality indicators. Now, some of these quality indicators are conventional as the SNR, CNO, geometry, and some are unconventional like the time constant, etc. Um, that influence the measurement errors. Now, with this information, we then understand fully both the distribution and the overbounding, which is the holy grail of integrity monitoring. Now, in order to test and validate, we are implementing a research in a GNSS PNT positioning and integrity monitoring architecture, employing what we call the situ a solution separation method. In the next slide, I'll show you um, a snapshot of this architecture, which seems to be a little bit complicated. Um, so at the top, we have um, the machine learning, which is, which is help, helping us with error characterization and overbounding. Uh, that feeds into the positioning machine and the integrity monitoring to get better solutions. So in the project now, we are at the GNSS resilient study level. Our next move is to study non-GNSS signal and to combine everything we talked about. This very interesting project is indeed a collaboration between many um, industry leaders, such as Imperial College, um, AstroTerra, and other parties. And I'll let John Mark talk a little bit about this project and where we are today. Thank you so much. Indeed, thanks for that, Mirai. It really, it is this academic rigor and the cut rigor, sorry, and this um, desire to innovate at Imperial and AstroTerra that really excites us. But it has to be said, if we don't have a platform or a way to reach our visually impaired market, then there really is no point in doing this. And I'm, I'm very fortunate and lucky to say that we do. We have the, the perfect partner um, for us to reach our community and to make sure that our navigation system is used so we have an impact on people's lives. And the way that we're going to be do, doing this is through WeWalk. So WeWalk is the world's most innovative smart cane. We've taken a standard white cane 
which tells you nothing more but what's directly in front of you. It's a bit of Stone Age technology, if you'd like. We've chopped off the handle and we've replaced it with all the tech inside. A handle which contains an ultrasonic sensor for upper body obstacle detection and a handle that also contains a lot of inertial sensors, including a gyroscope, accelerometer and compass, which we use currently for navigation to improve the user's positioning. We've also devised our WeWalk app, which is free to download, which the WeWalk smart cane connects to. Here, we can actually provide clock directions and a completely customized navigation interface based on the user requirements, which we have derived so far. And of course, this is going to continue to grow in support of this project. We also have a range of exploration features, and we've devised a new way for our users to interact with our navigation system through voice and through our partnership with Microsoft. But where does this lead us today? Well, I'm very, very excited to announce that in collaboration with WeWalk, Imperial College London, AstraTerra, and the Royal National Institute for the Blind, we are actually going to be delivering this indoor navigation system with system integrity in the next 18 months. We've been selected for an Innovate UK Smart Grant, and this marks the start of a very, very exciting journey where we can hopefully have a huge impact on visually impaired people's lives. And as Mirai perfectly said, this is a collaborative effort. And we've been joined by some absolutely extraordinary organizations, WeWalk, Imperial, AstraTerra, the Young Guru Academy in Turkey, Microsoft for Startups, who have been supporting us since February of 2019, Moorfields Eye Hospital, where I've taken a lot of expertise and they continue to um, nourish our knowledge on visual impairment, the Lloyd's Register Foundation, UCL, who have let us use their PAMLA facility, and of course, the Royal National Institute for Blind People, who provide us with invaluable expertise to make sure that what we develop and what we design actually meets the needs of our community. And so that marks the, the end of our webinar. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure for us to speak to you and, and to hopefully enlighten you into the navigation challenges faced by visually impaired people. All I can say is please contact us. We'd love to take questions now and um, we'd love to hear any of your collaborative thoughts or opportunities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jean-Marc. Thank you, Claire, so much for this opportunity.